was a long, long time later that she woke up. She had slept deeply, dreamlessly, without moving. Her feet still hung down over the edge of the bed. Her face still pointed at the wall opposite. She woke up slowly from a deep comfort. The room was light. Everything was beautiful. The sun was outside. Everything was still. Everything was just the same. She didn't move at all, but lay there motionless while she went over in her mind all the things that had happened yesterday and the day before. She remembered it without fear, without even embarrassment. Now that she had slept, she was stronger. What had happened had happened, and she was just going to have to work with it. This was the third day. Three bad days? They said luck came in threes. Well, at least she had had her sleep. Now, a good breakfast, and she would be ready. Breakfast. But she couldn't leave the hotel like this. She had only her suit on. No shoes or stockings, no nothing. No purse, no money. She wiggled her toes against the scratchy carpet. Her feet weren't cold, but they were bare, all right. She had not even a comb to run through her hair. She lay on the bed with her arms beside her. She lifted one of them up and put her hand on her hair. Her arm moved easily, but as if the command to move it had been twice removed. Her hair felt snarled around her face. It was still a little damp at the scalp. Her face was smooth. She pulled off first one false eyelash, then the other, and without moving anything but her arm, tucked them into her suit pocket. Then she ran one finger skillfully into the corner of one eye and pushed the sleep out of it. It was matted with a mucousy goo. She scraped her eyelashes between her fingernails to pull the flakes of sleep off. Then she did the other eye with the same hand. She did not move her left hand at all, but could feel the texture of the mattress under it. When she was done with her eyes, she picked her nose, pulling out a thin shell of dried mucus, and she rubbed her finger around the inside of her ears. This was the way to wake up in the morning, slowly. Move first the eyes, then one arm, now the neck, turn the head, the other arm, and at last she sat up. (laughs) In the mirror opposite, she saw herself reflected back. You really are beautiful. Her colors were soft and creamy pink. Her eyes looked enormous, and the old makeup around them was soft against her thick lashes. The morning light was radiant through the frail webbing of her tangled hair. She looked like a beautiful and old-fashioned child in a picture. It was partly the curtained light, of course, and partly the glow from just waking up. The pupils are still big, but she felt a genuine surge of love for her body. Such beautiful skin to die. She needed to call Jason. She knew he'd be at the grotto, even though it was surely early still. After all, the final countdown had started. Detonation would be tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. She had no trouble at all getting the operator this time. Where have you been? said Jason in great excitement when she reached him. I followed your advice, Jason, and slept in a hotel. We've been looking everywhere for you. When the Secret Service got to your apartment last night, it was in a shambles. Uh, Jason, I think that was just, I mean, it was kind of messy when I left it. 
The bathroom door was locked, the shower on, and towels rung out the window. I told you about that, Jason. Jesus, Marilyn, you had us all frantic around here. You should have checked in with us again to let us know you were all right. Well, I couldn't. I mean, I wasn't. <clears throat> I mean, somebody tried to get in my room last night. I mean, they tried to pick the lock, and I scared them away, and then I locked myself out of my room. Oh, Jason, but it wasn't correct. I mean, he would never have spent all that time trying to pick a lock. Who? Oh, Cora, do you know the man I told you about? Where are you now? I'm at the J&J Hotel. Where? The J&J. Where is it? On J Street. J Street. Jesus, Marilyn, you're not at the J&J. Yes, but Marilyn, that's a flea bag. I didn't have enough money to go anywhere else. A silence. And somebody tried to break in your room? Ha! Hardly surprising. What did you expect if you're going to stay in a place like that? Never mind. Look, I've got to ask you for a favor. I know you're being put under a lot of strain, and I wouldn't ask this of you under ordinary circumstances, but... Uh, I don't like to talk about this over the phone. I'm <clears throat> going to ask you, uh, if you don't want to do it, I'll understand, Marilyn, but uh, some things have come to my attention, and it's about the uh, difficulties we've been having. Do you follow me? Yes, I'm so sorry, Jason. Never mind that. Water under the bridge. To be perfectly clear, it's about uh, in an unfortunate, you know, loss. I understand, Jason. And you were perfectly right to be paranoid last night, Marilyn. I found that much out. Perfectly right. You have my deepest, deepest apology. That's okay, Jason. I didn't listen to you. I wasn't taking it seriously. But, you see, I don't know how to put this but it's a matter of the very delicate handling of the situation now. Somebody's found out. Right, that's right. And it's a matter of we don't want to give out any more information than the party already has. Are you following me, Marilyn? Yes, but we do want to. What we want to do is to reassure the party. I'd do it myself if it was possible, Marilyn. You know that. I think it's fair to warn you that there may be some danger involved. Unfortunately, because of the circumstances of the loss, the only person in the world who can accomplish this mission is you. I think I'd better just come in and talk to you about it in your office, Jason. I mean, I want to get everything absolutely straight about what I'm supposed to do. That would be the best thing, but unfortunately, it's not possible. I wasn't able to get a hold of you to give you warning, but you're due at this <clears throat> encounter in less than an hour. But Jason, I have to go home and dress. I'm sorry, there's no way out of it. Look, you know the situation, you know what to do. For all your black sins, Meryl and I know you have a grasp. Just play it by ear. I can't really tell you what to say anyway. You'll have to sound her out before you'll be in a position to accomplish the uh, reassurance. Sound who out? Olivia. Olivia? I'm afraid so. Of course. The reason she couldn't find the transcript was that she had lost it at Olivia's, and somehow Olivia found it and interpreted it. Everything fell into place very quickly. Olivia was British. Because of the desperate importance of total secrecy, the government had not been able to warn the British to disarm their warheads. There were going to be almost as many fatalities in the Commonwealth as in China. 
The British were sure to be upset over the news. As a matter of fact, one of the possibilities contemplated was that the detonations would end any friendly relations between Britain and the U.S. But why the shooting? Why the effort to get into her room last night? Could it have been Olivia herself? Why make a personal attack on Marilyn? That had to mean that she needed more information and was going to try to scare it out of her. Then uh, what you want me to do is to pretend like I'm telling her the whole story without giving anything new away and maybe mislead her about some crucial things while I'm at it? Exactly, exactly, Marilyn. I'd give anything if I could spare you this. That's okay, Jason. It was my fault in the first place. It's only right that it should be me who takes the chances. His voice wavered with emotion. No, no, I've been thinking things over and I feel totally responsible. But I can't take that burden off your shoulders, Marilyn. Nobody can. I'm sorry to say you're on your own this afternoon. This afternoon? What time is it? Twelve ten, and you have to be there at one. Takis. Oh, yes. She had made a date for lunch at Takis with Olivia at the party and forgotten all about it. So I better let you go. Good luck and stay on your toes. Goodbye, Jason. She could hardly go to talkies with no shoes, though. These were her alternatives. She could slip back up to her room, taking a chance that Olivia was not the, quote, killer, end quote, after all, and that whoever it really was was still waiting there for her. Once there, she could try her own hand at picking the lock. At least she knew it could be done. Or she could look around for the desk clerk and talk him into giving her another key, facing down those knowing eyes, that knowing smile. She decided to try her room first. Even though she was almost broke, it would be easier to deal with the world if she could get her clothes on first. When she got to her hallway, she peered curiously down it before she exposed herself. Then she walked noiselessly swiftly down the empty hall to her room, room 913, but room 913 had an enormous hole carved out of the door. Splinters of wood lay in the hallway and stuck out of the rough edges of the hole. There were dents and nicks in the solid part of the door and in the wall beside it and there were several places where little rents had been notched in the floor. A fire axe lay in the hallway beside the door, one of those little red hatchets kept in glass windows in places like this. God. She stepped through the hole into her room. Inside it, Korek stood waiting to receive her. But there was no way out. She was inside the room before she saw him. She swallowed her fear and faced him. Did you sleep well? He asked. Oh, yes, I feel much better. Come, my dear, you didn't run because you didn't feel well. Here's your purse. He handed her the damp bag. She took it gingerly. It was ruined. It was drying in streaks. Thanks. Did you see who it was? No. Then nobody saw who it was. He walked around the room like a cat, the energy waiting, dormant, ready to spring. Well, I guess people mind their own business in places like this, she said. Yes, here. Uh, here, I have something to show you. He reached down on the bed and smoothed his hands over the lump, which was the quote, dummy, end quote, she had bundled there in her desperation. It does look a little like somebody sleeping. His fingers stopped at a place on her coat, and he pulled something out of it. 
something that was embedded in it, like a pen. She stared at the object, which he placed in her palm. A dart, he said. The point was sharp against her thumb. She looked at him questioningly. For an air gun, he said. An air gun? You mean like a BB gun? Yes, yeah, sort of. Like a toy gun? No, not a toy gun. A gun. But for kids. Yes. She had forgotten how soft and expressive his dark eyes were. When she saw it, she had envisioned black coals, hard-burning black coals. But when she was standing next to him, he seemed so human. Do you know anyone with kids? he asked. Of course I do, she said. I know lots of people with kids. Do you think it was a kid? No. But it's not as serious as you thought, though. I mean, since it was just an air gun. He pulled a tiny object out of his pocket and placed it beside the dart in her palm. They were so light she could barely feel them. Yes, it was the crumpled little metal object that had bounced off that fire plug by her face. What had almost hit her was a mutilated dart. It must have hit sort of hard, she said. She was trying to be offhand, but a quick vision flashed across her mind of a dart burrowing into her skin, deep into her body. She closed it off. They used a canister. He said, this thing hit that fire plug from at least 30 yards. It hit hard. If it had hit you, it would have acted like a dum-dum boy inside you. It would have torn you to pieces. The image of the dark re returned briefly, twisting, pounding, a big red hole left behind it, like the hole in the chest of a man she had seen in a picture once. Oh! she said. Keep it offhand. I'm beginning to wonder about this whole setup, he said. On the one hand, whoever we've got here seems incredibly clumsy, insane, like that hole in the door, like the, these darts in the blankets. On the other hand, there is an element of smoothness that bothers me. No fingerprints? no trace. Maybe we've got some crazy individual who just happened to choose this time to strike and who just happened to miss twice in a row. On the other hand, he let his voice trail off. She waited for the rest of what he saw, but it didn't come. You don't think they really wanted to kill me? I didn't say that. I wouldn't count on that. But it's worth considering. I'm not saying it's definitely not somebody who just happened to choose yesterday to go off his rocker. I'm only suggesting that we look at some of the other alternatives and see if we can't come up with another scenario that makes sense. You mean like somebody trying to scare me? Yes into giving something away. You already saw to that, didn't you? His voice was gentle and resonant with emotion. But I could have told him they're taking the wrong tack. I scared the hell out of you and you didn't tell me a thing. You're a gutsy little girl and you're not going to tell me anything either, are you? Don't worry about it. I may have to find out the hard way, but I'll find it out. You're going to make me work for my money, though, aren't you? You'll make an honest man out of me. <laughs> Look, you're a pretty classy lady. I like you a lot. So I'm going to do you a favor, and I want you to do me a favor. My favor to you is that I'm not going to try and grill you. <laughs> and in return, I want you to take a little better care of yourself. No more third-story windows, okay? No more cheap hotels. I'm going to give you a ride back to the White House. And then I want you to 
ask somebody there to keep an eye on you, okay? How did you know I work at the White House? I know all kinds of things about you, Patsy. Why are you here? I was worried about you. What do you want from me? I want you to keep yourself alive for a couple more days anyway. She felt herself being sucked into the vacuum of his arms, but she held herself still. I don't trust you, she said. Of course you don't. You've got a lot of sense. You've got good instincts. I dreamed about you last night, she said. Was it true? She suddenly didn't know. She didn't recognize what was unbalancing her, just as a small child might have had difficulty putting his finger on an unfamiliar pain in his body. She was unable to define what she felt, and so she was unable to respond accurately to it. His lips were inches from hers, and then she no longer knew what she looked like, or what he looked like, or anything except the precise distance between her lips and his lips, the significance of which was lost to her. All significances were lost to her. She knew nothing for a moment except those dream things that float without meaning and passion, his hard body the extraordinarily large and neat taunt knot of his tie, the subtle change in color and texture as the skin of his face became his lips. She couldn't see the pores of his lips. For one brief moment, their lips touched. The contact was revolutionary. What she had seen with her eyes had become real against her. For an instant, something alien was touching her, something more alarmingly alien than had ever penetrated to her skin before. But by the time the rupture came, that strange presence against her lips had become part of her own body, and when it was torn away, she felt pulled apart. I'm turning my back, will you? properly dressed, he said. Her body drifted always into that reverie, no matter how firmly she tried to pull herself back into the world. I have to be at talkies at one, she said. Better get moving. In the elevator, she was aware of such things as the feel of her bare feet in her shoes. Her ankle tingled where Corrick's hand had brushed it helping her on with her shoes. She could not concentrate on what he was saying. However, it was a ride she would never forget. The precise colors of the paint peeling off the metal walls, the subtle odors, the feel of Corrick's body standing inches from her embedded themselves in the soft tissue of her memory. The big clock in the underground garage of the Parker building, in which Takis was located, said 12 minutes to 1 as they got out of the car. There's no sense in going early, she said. Might as well. But she couldn't stand it. What if it was Olivia who had shot at her? This might be the last 12 minutes of her life. And just at the time when she had realized for the first time the real value of a minute, it seemed too much to ask her to waste twelve of them. I'll walk you to the elevator, he said. As they waited, her eyes fell on a counter, which was once used for car rentals. She walked over to it and peered under it. Let's put it off as long as we can, she said. Can we just wait here for another minute? It's not the best place in the world to wait. We could duck under the counter, she said. Huh? She tilted her head in a beckoning motion, and he stepped behind the counter with her. Under the counter was a roomy carpeted shelf. They would be hidden from any eyes, and she could kiss him again. 
without fear of interruption. Why not? She tried to read his face, but she could see he didn't follow her meaning. He stood tense and alert, his eyes warily scanning the garage, listening. Why not? She too scanned the vast room for a minute. Nobody was on that level but them. Cars were sparsely parked here and there, waiting soundlessly for their owners. The exaggerated echoing of the place would give them plenty of warning if anybody were to come. They could be seen from the sidewalks that passed by the plate window, which blocked the garage from the street. But if they were under the counter, they would be invisible to everyone. She waited for two men to walk out of sight. Then she ducked under the counter and sat down there, her back against the counter wall, her feet stretched out under it. Korak stood rigid, his face expressionless, his body in a casual pose, but ready to leap. His eyes flitted rapidly around him, half closed to hide their intense work. Come on in, she said. It's padded. It's really pretty comfortable. She arched her head in invitation. He stood for a moment, silent, dangerous. Then, in a swift motion, he ducked down under the counter with her and crouched there. She didn't see him take it out of his clothes, but there was a gun instantly in his hand. He pulled it open and checked it, then clicked it shut again. He held the gun naturally, as if it were so much a part of his habit it was like an extension of him. He held the gun the way a clerk might hold a pencil, the way workers hold their tools. He held it with respect, and she could see in the lines of his body that he knew in every inch of him what it was for. It was to kill with. What's happening? She whispered. Her whisper echoed out into the garage, which amplified it. He glanced at her sharply. I don't know, he said. I was just about to ask you the same question. I mean, why have you got your gun out? No, you first. Why are we under this counter? It had been a terrible idea after all. I didn't want to leave just yet, she said meekly. I thought we would have more privacy down here. A low chuckle bubbled out of his mouth, brimming his eyes. More privacy? Yes, I thought we would be less conspicuous. Less conspicuous. Yes, well, I thought you might want to kiss me goodbye. He put the gun away. The laughter came out of him in great gasps that filled the garage like a starting engine. You wanted me to kiss you, he said, down here? For a moment she was poised between tears and laughter. The sounds burrowed their way out of his big chest. He lay on the narrow floor of the cupboard, writhing helplessly as the laughter wrung itself through him and up out of his mouth, then to circulate into the corners and eddies of the garage. You want <laughs> you wanted to you wanted to kiss me. Shh. However, her shushing only some summoned new spasms. Well, we had twelve minutes, she said. Ten now, and I didn't want to waste it. <laughs> no, by all means, you're absolutely right. Let's not waste it. And with that, he wrapped his arms around her gently, tenderly, letting her head rest in the crook of one elbow, his lips touching her ever so lightly here and there on her face. Suspended in that moment, she forgot who she was or where she was. She achieved the intense but unaware consciousness that animals have, that humans search for and fear. She was aware of the contours of his ribcage, and she was aware of the quivering inside it, like the fluttering of a bird's heart. She was aware of his mouth against her mouth, as if they were feeding on each other, but she wished for nothing. 
There were no satis dissatisfactions. She craved for nothing but what she had in that moment, that out-of-time moment, which was finally ruptured when he drew away from her. Time's up, he said. No, just ten more seconds, she said. You're a funny little duck, aren't you, he said. They were both silent as she smoothed her hair and pulled her suit straight. It had been slept in, yanked this way and that, and it had survived climbing out of a bathroom window in the rain. This one more little rumpling wasn't going to hurt it. He touched her hand to hold her before she got up. You can't get involved with anyone, she said. That's okay. That doesn't matter to me. Take care of yourself, 